Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning Bible study. Uh, we are currently going through the Psalms, and this morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Both of them are short, and the reason why I'm putting them together is because they are speaking about the same subject. So we're going to be looking at overcoming spiritual depression. I know it hits all of us, you know, and sometimes it, it seems like it's really tough to shake. But we're going to see what the scriptures have to say about it. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this time that you've given us to study your word. Lord, I pray for everyone that's watching, all that are listening that you would speak to them, Lord. I know we're living in a time where so many are hurting. So many are, are just, they're depressed and they just see no hope in the things that are going on. So Father, I pray that you would speak to them through the teaching this morning. And uh, God, it's a good study. It really ministered to me, Lord. So go before us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. This is to the chief musician, a contemplation of the sons of Korah. Psalm 42, verse 1. As a deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And then the night his song shall be with me a prayer to the God of my life. I will sing to God, my rock. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Psalm 43, vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And on the harp I will praise you. O oh God, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance. Am my God. In 1965, D. Martin Lloyd Jones, the pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, he published a book entitled Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cure. It became one of the most highly valued and widely circulated books he ever wrote. The only conceivable reason that it's been so popular is not that the subject itself is attractive, but that so many people, including Christians, are depressed and they're looking for solutions. 
We are all depressed at times. I mean, we get down in the dumps. We sing the blues. <laughs> we feel that God has forgotten us and we will never be able to get on track with God again. It's a condition the old mystics accurately labeled the dark night of the soul. We wonder why it's happening, especially if we are Christians. Irma Bombeck asked in the title of one of her best-selling books, if life is a bowl of cherries, why am I living in the pits? Well, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 are about depression. And since most of us get down in the dumps at some time or another, We find Psalm 42, verse 5 and 11, and Psalm 43, verse 5, asking the question, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now, I want you to notice that through it all, the psalmist says, I shall yet praise him. He's saying what I'm going through right now is not the end of my life's drama. Psalm 42 as well as Psalm 43 are written by the sons of Korah. So the Korites were Levites. They descended through Kohath, Korah's father. We find them in 1 Chronicles chapter 6 and 9 and 2 Chronicles chapter 20. They were the ones who performed the music in the temple. But the interesting thing is, when the children of Israel were wandering in the desert, Korah led a rebellion of 250 leaders against Moses. And they ended up perishing by God's judgment including the other leaders and their families. It's referenced in number 16, and also you can see it in Jude, verse 11. Now, for some reason, the sons of Korah weren't a part of that judgment. But with what had happened, the belief is they dedicated themselves to writing music to praise God in the wilderness tabernacle, and then later in the temple there in Jerusalem. Psalm 43 and 43 are seen together because in a number of the Hebrew manuscripts, the Psalms are joined as one. Psalm 43 has no title. And even though every other Psalm, except the Psalm 71 does, the words are repeated, tying them together. Most likely the greatest reason is because both deal with spiritual depression. Now, there are various reasons for spiritual depression, but I want you to notice they also indicate the cure. First, not able to go to God's temple where God is worshiped. We see that in Psalm 42, verses one to two. Now, we don't know from the title of this psalm who wrote it, but the assumption is it was one of the sons of Korah. We can see what is bothering him. He was far from home in Jerusalem. He was far from the temple worship. It made him feel like he was cut off from God. You ever feel like that? Like God's just cut you off? The psalm begins with him panting after God as a deer pants for water brooks when he can't find water. Now, we don't know exactly where this guy was. Scripture doesn't tell us, nor why he was there. But we're given some details. He says he's writing from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar, now, the word Mizar means little hill or little mountain. Today, we don't know of a hill by that name. But the land of Jordan 
is the area beyond the Jordan to the north and east where Mount Hermon is. Mount Hermon is where the transfiguration took place with Jesus. And Peter, James, and John were on that mountain with him. So Mizar could have been a small mountain in the Hermon range of mountains. Now this area is far from Jerusalem. Some have suggested if a person was headed east in the direction of Babylon, this is the last point from where he might see the familiar mountains of their homeland to the south. So the psalmist is far from home. He feels he's far from God. It's not that he doesn't believe God is everywhere or that God is not with him because he's praying to God in these psalms. Here's the problem. Being away from home has gotten him down. Being in a depressed state has caused him to feel God is no longer with him. Now to understand the scope of this sense of alienation, we need to remember the job of his sons of Korah was to do what? <laughs> Perform the worship in the temple. So this person is being forced away from Jerusalem because he's absent from his work. It gives him a sense He's no longer useful. In fact, what he did reflected on his whole purpose for living. It was his life. It was his life. You may have found yourself in a place like this before and literally felt forced away from your heart's desire. I've lost a few jobs before. At times, I've been stuck in a job that was just a nowhere job. It was nothing. I knew I would never come out of it. <laughs> nothing good would. It's things like this that can lead to depression for some people. Old age will sometimes do that. It's when a person feels his or her useful days are over. They're behind you. What are you gonna do? Secondly, the sarcasm, the mocking, the insults from unbelievers. We see this in Psalm 42, verse 3 and 10. Not only was he far from home, he was surrounded by unbelievers who mocked him and kept saying to him, where is your God? Where is your God? I mean, no doubt it hurt him. No doubt it got to him. How do we know this? Because he repeats what they're saying twice. You see, back in the old days, in ancient times, almost no one was a true-to-life atheist. I mean, the first real atheism came with Greek philosophy. So the mocking and the insults didn't mean God didn't exist but that God had abandoned him. That God had abandoned him. Where's your God when you need him? Where's your God now? I mean, that can be a cause for being depressed. Why doesn't God hear my cries? Why doesn't God intervene and change my circumstances? Where is he? The third reason Thoughts of better days. Thoughts of better days. Psalm 42, 4. The psalmist was troubled when he remembered the better days in his life. How things were just going good. There was joy. I mean, it was something worth living for. But there's a way of dealing with this in times when we're depressed. It's remembering what God has done in the past. It's a great encouragement to believe God will do it again. But that's not the first thing we find here. What we find is a writer remembering the good days. 
the days he used to go with the people as he led them to God's house, <laughs> as they had shouts of joy and thanksgiving. C.S. Lewis hits on this in a chapter called The Fair Beauty of the Lord in Reflections on the Psalms. That's why he says, he calls it an appetite for God and argues it had all the cheerful spontaneity of a natural, even a physical desire. They are glad and rejoice. Let's have a song. Bring the tambourine. Bring the merry harp with the lute. We're going to sing merrily and make a cheerful noise. Noise, you might well say, mere music is not enough. Let everyone, even the benighted Gentiles, clap their hands. Let us have clashing cymbals, not only well-tuned, but loud. And dances, too. Let even the remote islands, all islands were remote, for the Jews were no sailors. Share the exaltation. You know, our services today don't have the same exuberance as the worship was in the temple. And there are some good reasons for that. Today, for a lot of Christians, some of their best memories are of worshiping with other believers in church, <laughs> especially at holidays like Christmas, Easter, resurrection morning. Not being a part of these times, as well as remembering them, can contribute to depression. There's a fourth reason we see here. The trials of life can seem so overwhelming. So overwhelming. Just seems like there's no end to it. Psalm 42, verse 7. The writer is speaking of the overwhelming trials in his life. Notice how he refers to them. All your waves and billows have gone over me. Now, even though we're not given any indication of what these trials were, we can imagine the tough circumstances that had taken him away from his home and from his work there in Jerusalem. It's like he's seeing the waves of evil, evil fortune breaking over his head. There's a fifth reason here, God failing to act quickly on his behalf. Psalm 42, verse 9. Verse 9 is a cry to God for having forgotten him. It reminds us of Jesus crying from the cross. Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, the fact is, it's just not unusual for a depressed person to feel forsaken by God. There's a sixth reason. Attacks from deceitful, wicked, ungodly people. Psalm 43, verse 1. Another cause of depression? Attacks by wicked enemies. Those who were attacking him unjustly because he's praying for vindication and he's pleading his cause to God. You know, I think every one of us can relate to this. We try to live for God, even though we're unjustly accused, attacked, and at times even slandered. You know what, let me tell you this. Don't be surprised. <laughs> Jesus told us about this. In John 15, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. It's a part of our makeup to feel depressed, 
by malicious and hurtful treatment. I mean, it's just who we are. It gets to us, it gets under our skin. In his book, Spiritual Depression, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones gives some more ways of being depressed spiritually. Temperament. Some people are just more inclined to depression than others. Physical conditions. I mean, we could be affected by adverse physical health. How about a down reaction after a great blessing? <laughs> oh man, been there, did that movie many times. An example is Elijah after his great victory over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. How about the attacks of Satan? One of his strategies is to get us to take our eyes off of God. He's a master at it. And simple unbelief. I mean, probably the most significant cause of all. Just unbelief. Believing that God can do this or that. Maybe this morning you're sensing a great disappointment in this life. Maybe it's a personal failure. Maybe it's the burden of getting old. Hello. <laughs> the list can go on and on and on. So what is the cure for spiritual depression? Well, the world turns to false cures. Some try to escape depressing realities of their lives through divorce. With some, it's excessive entertainment or always going on vacations. Some take pills. Others are on habit-forming drugs. But what about for you and me as, as believers, as Christians? We're told how we can win over depression. Number one, we deal with whatever it is and we wrestle it through. We deal with whatever it is and we wrestle it through. The way the psalmist is looking at depression, he doesn't give in to depression or self-pity. He deals with it head on. He wrestles it through. The psalmist reminds himself of what he really knows, that there is no good reason for being down in the dumps especially when he has a strong and calm hope in God. It all goes back to God. In other words, he's talking to himself rather than allowing circumstances to talk to him. Man, if we could only get that down in our brains, these thick skulls of ours. He's talking to himself rather than allowing the circumstances to talk to him. It's the very essence of wisdom in the matter. You talk yourself through it. You talk yourself through it. It's the mind speaking to the emotions rather than the emotions dictating to the mind. One commentator said this, it's a struggle between the spirit of faith and the spirit of dejection between the higher nature and the lower, between the spirit and the flesh. Secondly, we challenge ourselves to do what should be done. You see, in this battle against depression, you have to challenge yourself to do what the spiritual self knows should be done. You place your hope in God you place your hope in God. I mean, there's no lasting hope in anything else in this sinful world. You know what? There never has been, nor were, will there ever be, ever. Besides, as believers, we've put our trust in God in the past. God worked it out for us. So guess what? News flash. <laughs> he will do it again. He will do it again. It's just plain sanity 
to do what we're being told to do. Third, we remind ourselves of something that is certain. We remind ourselves of something that is certain. Guys, this is where faith comes in. To hope in God leads to the final step in battling depression. It's based on the character of the God we trust. The psalmist says, I will yet praise him. I will yet praise him. The scripture couldn't be any clearer. God doesn't and hasn't changed. <laughs> it means God's purposes for you and I have not changed either. I mean, we're told that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. God has led us into victories in the past. Well, he'll do it again. He'll do it again. So instead of looking at the past as something that we lost, how about we look to the good things yet to come, what God's going to do? Let's reflect a little on what we've learned here. First, the psalmist remembers the former days at the temple and is oppressed by the memory. Secondly, he draws on memory again, but this time it's to remember God and God's goodness. Third, he's troubled by his enemy sarcastically mocking and insulting him. You see, God is absent, but God is his rock. And by the time we come to Psalm 43, verse 2, not only is God his strength, man, you guys picking this up? Now he's praying confidently that God will guide him back to the place of worship and the joys he had in days gone by. It all begins with lamentations. Then it becomes a strong, believing prayer. It's back to Mount Zion. It's to the temple where God dwells. It's to God's altar before the temple. And finally, it's to God himself. Notice the progression as he considers and talks his way back to where he needs to be. You guys know what I'm talking about. You talk yourself back, man. I mean, it's good to remember those days. It's awesome. But if you're far from those days, you got to get back there. If you don't, it's going to take your health down even more. The psalmist nails it in Psalm 43, verse 4. Look what he says. 43, verse 4. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And on the harp, I will praise you, O God, my God. Guys, we need to understand this morning, the cure for depression is not in us. It's not in us. I don't care what you try doing. It's in God. It's to seek his face so we won't be and feel so down and out. What we find is the psalmist doing after he's laid it all out before the Lord, he returns to seeking his God. He returns to trusting God. And you know what? God will again bring him through what he's dealing with. It's a powerful lesson for you and me this morning. I mean, we look at the things that are going on in our country the things that are happening in the world. Is there any hope? There's always hope. We serve a God of hope. And you know what? He is going to bring us through. Whatever it is we're dealing with, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a disease, whether it's a death, whatever it might be, 
God will bring us through this. You have to turn and you have to seek after God again afresh. You have to get back in church. <laughs> get back in doing what you were doing when you were blessed. When God was using you. When you were meeting with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Worshiping God corporately together. That's the cure. That's the cure. Being back with God's people, trusting God and allowing him, enabling us to shake this thing off. Just like Paul the apostle, when that snake latched on his hand, what'd he do? He didn't go screaming to mommy, shook it off. And he kept on going forward. So the only way we're going to do it in these days, man, we got to stay focused. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. Lord, there's so much here in your word. There's everything that we need for the issues that we deal with on a daily basis. It's all in your word, God, if we would just learn to read it on a continual basis. Lord, I want to lift up all those that are watching and listening. Whatever they might be going through physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever the case is, God, you know exactly right where they're at. And you love them, Lord. And you want to bring them through that. God, I pray, touch their hearts, touch their spirit, touch their mind, touch Touch their very soul, God, and draw them back into a, that loving relationship with you, Lord. God, sometimes you can be so close, and yet we feel as if you are very far from us. Many times we can feel forgotten. Many times we can feel, God, that you don't care. And yet we know the Bible contradicts those things. The Bible tells us that you do care. The Bible tells us that you love us, that you are very concerned with what we have to deal with and go through. So Father, I lift everyone up that's watching and whatever it is they're dealing with, Father, that even now you will touch their minds. Touch your hearts, God. Pull them through whatever this is, Lord. God, bring that joy again. Bring that laughter. The Bible says laughter is good like medicine. It is good. And Father, we do praise you. And we thank you for how good you are to us and what you've done for us. No matter how low in the totem pole we may feel this morning, the great news is we're going to spend eternity with you. All this will be past. It'll be over. And we'll be starting fresh all over again. All, with all of our loved ones, all of our friends and acquaintances, that had a personal relationship with you, God, and it will never, ever, ever end, ever. You'll be for all eternity. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I love you guys, Lord willing. I'll see you Wednesday. Sermon of the Mount, as we continue our studies in the Gospel of Matthew. If I don't see you then, I'll see you in the air. <laughs> Man, it's got to happen soon, right? Hopefully it's sooner than we think. God bless you guys. Love you, man. See ya.